So this first segment after lunch, uh, I'm going to share with Wint Aldrich here. Um, we're both going to talk about um, more on a wet more and. Um, Wint's going to give you some more of the, uh, the sort of social history, and I'm going to talk about their architectural work. Um, Thank you, Warren. As I said earlier, it's, it's wonderful that Hudson River Heritage is doing this on an annual basis, uh, educational outreach, and wonderful this year that we're celebrating our railroad heritage and the centennial of our marvelous station here. The importance of the Hudson River Railroad, or later New York Central Railroad, to the life of our communities in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries cannot be overstated. Passenger service to New York City made weekend and vacation travel, as well as business travel, convenient. Shopping trips to Poughkeepsie, where there were trolleys to take one up Main Street, became a custom. The first ticket sold at the new station in 1914 according to the Rhinebeck Gazette, was a fare to Poughkeepsie, I suspect a round-trip fare. This is the way all uh, our out-of-town mail came to us. The U.S. mail operated mail cars on passenger trains in which mail was sorted for delivery at each station, sometimes with a sack thrown from the moving train. Light freight also moved on passenger trains in baggage cars, especially perishables like wholesale violets, and some dairy products. The Railway Express Agency was a big business, the UPS and FedEx of its day. And uh, as an example of their good efforts in delivering um, the, uh, the material to uh, the addressee, uh, in 1900, for reasons that are too complicated to explain, my grandmother found herself uh, in China uh, as part of the relief mission in to relieve the uh, foreign delegations which were besieged by the boxers who were essentially a very well organized uh, uh, terrorist from uh, the interior of China uh, who were on a rampage with the permission of the Empress uh, and um, uh, somehow along the way uh, before she came home she acquired a, an antique Chinese cannon and uh, had it sent to Rokeby at Barrytown and didn't think much more of it. Four years later, a message was sent up from the freight house at Barrytown for Miss Chandler. Uh, there's a rather heavy parcel here. Uh, could you send a wagon down to, to pick it up? And she said, well, I, I don't remember any heavy parcel. I don't know what this is. Uh, well, bring it up. Uh, up it came. She looked at it. Of course, it was all wrapped up. And, she, and then she saw some Chinese writing on it. My cannon! <laughs> and it's there in front of the house today. We, 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 uh, we put some black powder in it and, and uh, with a ramrod to stuff yesterday's New York Times down the barrel and, and fire it off on special occasions. The Chinese cannon, courtesy of the Railway Express Agency. Then the railroad provided electronic communication. The Western Union telegrams were sent and received through the telegraph operators or station masters, who were usually the first to know urgent bad news or good news coming to local citizens. Governor Morton, right here outside of Rhinecliff, decided that this should not be the case with his election results and had a private line telegraph run up to Ellerslie from the wires on the railroad. I think he always won, so he really needn't have worried. Today, all of these services at Rhinecliff have been reduced to mere express passenger service, uh, and in fact have been entirely eliminated uh, at Stottsburg, Barrytown, and Tivoli, which are utterly closed down uh, for any of the uh, railroad operations. Now, the origins of our railroad along the river. The river transport by steamboat and sloop ceased in the wintertime. Uh, and this past month is a good example of uh, how tightly the river can freeze up. In our case, this year, uh, to our great delight, uh, those of us who go ice boating. A railroad would be more time efficient than a steamboat. And so the Hudson River Railroad was incorporated by the state of New York and obtained from the state a charter and the power of eminent domain with which to acquire its water level route. Opponents were vociferous and included Washington Irving, who to this day, you go to Sunnyside down there in Westchester County 
and you can see just how close the rail line is to his front lawn and almost at the same grade. So he really has to see the river. He has to look through the, look through the, uh, uh, the trains as they pass. Um, a newspaper publisher who also lives in that area, General James Watson Webb, used his newspaper furiously to oppose this outrage. And then up in the town of Red Hook, John Church Kruger, who would move from what we know of as Blythewood uh, to Kruger's Island, taking a, a peninsula, really, in the river that, that took his name, built a wonderful big Swiss chalet of a house, uh, sponsored an expedition to Yucatan and was given uh, uh, as a thank you some marvelous Mayan uh, statuary which he put in a false ruin that he built as a folly uh, on part of his land. And then the railroad came through just a few years later. Uh, and he was furious. His feeling and that of Irving and the others was this was the machine in the garden, a phrase from a uh, sociological historian uh, of the 20th century. Uh, of the introduction of industry into the pristine landscape uh, of the American um, uh, world. Uh, and uh, he commissioned a, a landscape painter, it happens to be a German named Heine, uh, to paint a very large canvas from the uh, viewpoint of somebody standing more or less where the Bard Gymnasium is now, uh, looking out to the northwest, the river, Kruger's Island down below, and the Catskill Mountains, uh, and it's a marvelous picture. It's dated 1853, two years after the through train started on this line. Uh, there is absolutely no trace of the railroad or of the trains. Uh, Mr. Kruger wanted to document uh, his paradise, his garden, as it was before the infernal machine uh, invaded. Uh, smoke, noise, cutting off access to the river, these were the, these were the arguments. John B. Jervis was the genius civil engineer, one of the first and greatest of America's civil engineers, who was hired by the board of the Hudson River Railroad uh, to lay out the route uh, and to address uh, uh, people with dissident views like the ones that I've described. Uh, he had already designed the uh, Delaware and Hudson Canal, Port Jervis bears his name. He had designed the uh, Harlem Valley Railroad, which in its origins came from lower Manhattan or mid-Manhattan uh, up to the, through the village of Harlem and then eventually across the Harlem River uh, into uh, Westchester County as it was then, later the Bronx, and gradually to White Plains and then finally just keeping that name, Harlem, so Harlem had nothing whatever to do with Millerton and so forth, all the way up to uh, uh, eventually to um, Chatham. Uh, and uh, uh, he designed um, uh, the Croton Aqueduct, which was probably his most famous uh, contribution because it really made the, it made the expansion of, of the city of New York possible, uh, providing uh, pure water in sufficient uh, quantity from Westchester County to the, uh, to the city. Uh, so Jervis was a, was a brilliant choice. Uh, I was asked to participate in a, in a panel discussion. I don't remember what the subject was. It had something to do with the Hudson River a good many years ago. And on the panel was Pete Seeger. And, and I told the story that I'm quoting from Jervis's own memoirs of the problems that he had with people like Washington Irving and John Church Kruger and the others. Uh, Jervis said, they abused me as though I was nothing uh, little better than a barbarian for, for doing this terrible thing. They said that uh, it would be destroying the riverfront and it would be uh, uh, creating all sorts of, of, of uh, problems, uh, industrial uh, and otherwise uh, environmental, we would say today. Um, and he said, in his memoir, he said, of course, my response was that I'm building a, a, a seawall that will protect your river edge from uh, the erosion of the waves and the action of the winter ice. And, uh, but they still abuse me as being little better than a barbarian. When Pete Seeger's turn to come to speak, he looked at me and he said, that is exactly what Mr. Jervis and the railroad board were little better than barbarians. 
As you may know, Pete Seeger lived in Beacon, and he commuted regularly on Metro North. <laughs> However, we let that pass. Now, in order to acquire the land, uh, they had to, under the eminent domain law, they had to file with the state and with the respective counties uh, a map of what they proposed to take. And indeed, the filing and the acceptance of that map, in effect, transferred the, the land. They also had to, had to pay the individual property owners who were uh, losing some real estate. Um, that takings map is one of the uh, masterworks, I think, of civil engineering and surveying uh, of the mid-19th century. And each county has its segment on file, and I've seen the one in, down in Poughkeepsie. Uh, it was mislaid some years ago, but they have copies of it, and I, I hope that they'll, they'll find it. But the original for the entire stretch from Albany to, to New York City is on file and is not mislaid up in Albany, the Office of General Services. And let me describe it to you. It's, I suppose, about oh, 16, 18 inches high. Uh, it's about, uh, well, for the county, I suppose it's probably 15 feet long. Um, for the whole state, it's, it's tremendously long. And you, you sort of unroll it and, and roll it up and you just, until you get to the where you want to be. It's on marvelous varnished blue linen, and it is drawn with the most meticulous detail in three or four colors, green ink, red ink, blue ink, and black ink. And each ink reflects either what was being taken, or what presently exists, or where there are buildings that are going to be demolished, or where there are buildings and docks that are going to be left, and so forth. And then the property owners are identified. Um, and so coming through Rhinecliff, it's marvelous because it's a, it's a snapshot of exactly what was here in the pre-railroad age uh, in terms of ferries and sloop landings and uh, steamboat landings and warehouses and so forth. Um, I strongly recommend uh, inspecting it, those of you who love maps as I do. The first president of the railroad, at least the president at the time that uh, this stretch was being built was James Borman, who was a businessman in New York. And in fact, Rhinecliff was for a time known as Borman's, apostrophe S, uh, as if he owned it. But he didn't. He may have been living here uh, because uh, this was started as a railroad town. The, the, the construction crews uh, were based here, building uh, this stretch probably from Poughkeepsie uh, up to Barrytown. And, uh, but Borman's was given a more romantic name, Rhinecliff, not long after. That apostrophe S, we heard it today at Fraley's and at Silvernails. These were farmers' names, and they were little flag, flag stops on the other railroad. Um, uh, the best known example, I think, and the one that, that survived into the 20th century was Garrison's. What we know of Garrison, New York, as a stop on Metro North, was Garrison's. There was a man named Garrison trying to think what his first name was, it, it, it may have been Taylor Garrison, who owned the pedestrian ferry service over to West Point from, from Garrison. And, and so he had a little business there, and it was, a, it was a, an obvious place for the railroad to have a stop so that people who wanted to go to West Point could go could across. So it was just called Garrison's, meaning Garrison's uh, station stop. And uh, eventually the apostrophe and the S were dropped. I used to think that it was because of the uh, Revolutionary War, there were garrisons, military garrisons, up on the hills. Nothing whatever to do with that. This is how history can get kind of a little twisted. Um, one of the members of the board uh, was William Chamberlain. And by this time, he had become a successful import-export uh, uh, man in New York City with, a, with a, a big business, and had acquired a, a wonderful federal house in Red Hook with its farm known as Maisland, uh, where he spent his summers and, and raised his family. Uh, he got himself put on the board of the Hudson River Railroad, partly because he had this interest in Dutchess County. Um, but then he found himself uh, locked in argument with his fellow board members and with their invaluable hired hand, uh, Mr. Jervis, uh, because he said, well, it's fine to come along the river down in the highlands, which was a 
technically a very difficult place to build uh, because of the nature of the land, but they had to be on the water there because they couldn't go up into the high ground. Uh, but as soon as we get to Beacon, or Fishkill Landing as it was then known, we should go inland, and we should go up basically along the Albany Post Road and make it much more effective picking up agricultural produce from all of these agricultural communities going north all the way up into Columbia and, and maybe even to Rensselaer County uh, before coming back down to the river and going into Albany. And uh, Jervis said, well, this is ridiculous. If we're on the river, uh, w what speed is what counts here. Delivering our passengers or our freight uh, to Albany as fast as we possibly can. And uh, that's nonsense. Those farmers can bring the produce down to the river landings and put it on the train. So he was kind of irked at this, and, uh, and he quit the board. And uh, uh, 20 years later, uh, he made uh, common cause with, with uh, Thomas Cornell, as, you, as we heard this morning, and uh, they created their own railroad from Rhinecliff into Connecticut, going through Red Hook, which he was very interested in. He was the founder of the First National Bank of Red Hook, which is now the local key bank branch there. Um, and so he, you know, it took him 20 years, but he did, he did get involved in, in trying to address this, this specific issue. However, he still had, and his descendants, my, uh, my cousins, the Chandlers in Rhinebeck, still have uh, his little silver uh, token uh, saying, Hudson River Railroad, uh, free pass. William Chamberlain, and it, all he had to do was to present that, at least while he was on the board and maybe for the rest of his life, and he could get uh, a free trip to New York or back. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, that Mr. Chandler ever tried to use it on the New York Central or on uh, Amtrak, but uh, my guess is if he had, they would have uh, given a, a good chuckle and taken his money. Uh, there was a problem, an engineering problem, crossing the Tivoli Bays. Uh, it's very uh, soft ground. Uh, they probably tried uh, driving pilings and so forth, and they, uh, it took a long time to do it. And so the, the, uh, I think a year and a half was spent on that. So for a long time, Poughkeepsie or maybe Rhinecliffe was the northern terminus, and then you take a boat and go up to Hudson or go all the way to Albany. And... Uh, and of course not do anything in the wintertime. And finally, they were able to solve that. They built causeways and bridges and, uh, and trestles. Uh, and the first through train from New York to Albany uh, was in October of 1851. Uh, as you can see from the, that wonderful uh, card that we've all been given, Commodore Vanderbilt took control of the Hudson River Railroad in 1867 and merged it with the New York Central, which had been created from Albany to Buffalo, more or less, by Erastus Corning and other upstate interests. Um, and uh, the decision was, well, the, right into the middle of the 20th century, the legal name of the corporation was the Hudson River and New York Central Railroad. Um, but it was always known uh, commercially as the New York Central. Um, in those early days, there were three southbound and three northbound trains a day stopping at Barrytown, and perhaps more at Rhinecliff, if it was then an express stop. I'm, I, I should know that, but I don't. The old Rhinecliff station was at grade with the tracks at the foot of Shatzel Avenue, as we heard this morning, um, just, a, just catty corner to the hotel. Uh, it was a, a frame building, I think, uh, judging from the photograph. <coughs> um, there was a grade crossing here, which of course is always risky, uh, leading to the ferry slip, uh, which was just across the way. Um, the station probably uh, resembled the station at Hudson, which dates to the post-Civil War years and is now the oldest station in use on this line. The station here was not a Union station, this is a question I asked Bernie this morning, shared with the Rhinecliff in Connecticut, as the latter had their own station, passenger station farther north the end of this long parking area um, near a slate dock. The New York Central Railroad decided to expand their operation from two to four tracks, effective in 1912. 
Remember, in those days, it was not only serving local and express passenger trains, such as the 20th Century Limited, it was also a heavily used freight line. Even in the 1950s and 60s, I can remember 200 car freight trains r rolling noisily past Barrytown, as I think I mentioned this morning. And I should tell you uh, another one of my asides, a story about our neighbor Gore Vidal, who lived at Edgewater, which was right uh, backed up onto the tracks, was on the river side of the tracks at Barrytown. Um, he used to give uh, dinner parties and have house guests there uh, during the 20 years that he owned Edgewater, toward the end of which he ran for Congress uh, on the Democratic ticket and didn't get very far. Uh, in fact, he was interviewed by the Poughkeepsie Journal uh, during that campaign in 1962, I think it was, congressional campaign, uh, uh, as a Democrat, uh, do you expect to win, Mr. Vidal? No, of course I don't. Uh, you see, every two years, the electorate in this district creep out of the woodwork and vote for William McKinley. Gore Vidal liked, uh, liked a good line better than he did winning uh, elective office, I think. In any event, he'd give these dinner parties, and he knew from experience, and maybe from consulting the timetable before dinner, exactly when that 200-car freight with square wheels would be rumbling past the house. And he'd be sort of watching his, uh, looking at his watch surreptitiously, um, but holding forth uh, brilliantly and everyone agog and no other conversation around the table. They listened to his witticisms. And then just as he knew that that train was going to be passing the Aldriches and the Chapmans and he could begin to feel some vibration, he'd turn to the person on his right or left and say, now tell me all about yourself. Of <laughs> course, nobody could hear anything for the next seven or eight minutes. Uh, and then he'd resume. So this change in 1912 entailed a huge capital expenditure, broadening the rail bed by means of rock excavation and fill, replacing grade crossings with bridges. Uh, we got one at Rokeby, uh, uh, to our great good fortune. Enlarging tunnels, like the Astor Tunnel up here, uh, which had to be widened or, or a new tunnel uh, board, and improving signal systems. New and more efficient stations were part of this, especially at express stops like Rhinecliff and Poughkeepsie. In both cases, complicated sites that included building on a bluff and here with the need to provide vehicle access to the ferry. We lucked out with our new station, designed in brick and limestone in the then newly fashionable Spanish mission style with its distinctive red tile roof and projecting eaves. Inside were multiple entrances, one served by a grand staircase, marble, floors of tile, comfortable waiting room benches, elevators to the tracks, and the freight house tucked into an L. <clears throat> and of course, the viaduct to the ferry slip, which is now our public landing, and the elegant pedestrian crossing right outside the hotel. The architects were Warren and Wetmore, who at the same time were finishing their magnum opus for the uh, railroad, Grand Central Terminal, uh, 1913. And we've, I think, all been aware that their centennial was last year and uh, wonderfully uh, celebrated at parties and news articles and uh, exhibitions in New York and books. Um, and Warren and Wetmore were to design the Newburgh Station, recent, recently restored as a restaurant uh, and a performance space, and I think the Great Detroit Station. I'm not sure of that. It's now vandalized and derelict, and perhaps others. And maybe Warren will be able to tell us more about that. A talented firm, the senior partner, Whitney Warren, had social connections that would have stood him in good stead with the Vanderbilts and others on the board of the railroad. He also had Hudson Valley connections, being a descendant of the rich industrialist Warrens of Troy and a grandson of Mrs. Phoenix, whose wonderful country house at Hudson we know as the Oliver Bronson House, a masterwork by A.J. Davis, now undergoing restoration by a local nonprofit. It is not surprising, therefore, that Whitney Warren received the commission to design the Columbia County Courthouse in Hudson and the magnificent marble-clad bank building on nearby Warren Street. Nearer to us here, he designed, the rock, uh, designed Rock Ledge, a big masonry house with a commanding view on a hilltop east of Route 9, south of Rhinebeck, for his sister and brother-in-law, the William Starr Millers. 
Some have called our station the Little Grand Central, but Rhinecliff is not a city which might justify a showpiece station. Was someone prodding the railroad's board and executives? Very likely, I think. This station would have been important to Colonel Astor and to Governor Morton, both of whom used it and were keen for civic improvements here. Ogden Mills, too, might have caught express trains here. All three of them were likely large stockholders in the New York Central Railroad. The new station began operation on September 17, 1914. The Rhinebeck Gazette reported on the first ticket sold, as I said. <clears throat> but surprisingly, there appears to have been no brass band or political orations. Most of the relevant coverage by the Gazette that year focused on the matter of improved road access. Vincent Astor, then only 22 years old and two years into his stewardship of Ferncliff and his father's fortune, offered to give the town a right of way for a new road access now, that now comprises the last several hundred yards of roadway approaching the station from the north, in three, Road 308. For this, he was editorially commended by the paper. The town was a bit slow in accepting the gift, waiting to see if the state and the railroad would help with the cost of creating the link. And in this, I think Vincent Astor uh, was, uh, uh, he adored his father. He was just devastated by, by his father's death. Uh, and he had known his father, who was a keen enthusiast of the automobile, one of the first uh, owners of automobiles in this neighborhood, and constantly experimenting with new models and, uh, and new manufacturers. Um, uh, like to see how fast his cars could go, and of course on these local roads you couldn't go very fast. Uh, and so he invented a machine to improve macadam, improve the, the uh, functioning of, of roadways, uh, and then made available to the town uh, the new stretch of River Road from where Ryan Road begins on the north end uh, down to 308. It's about a quarter of a mile, I guess, nicely uh, lined with, uh, with maple trees uh, and uh, he didn't, in, in that case, give the land to the town. Uh, he gave the public permission to use the road, which I think he built, uh, but he could uh, one day a year close it and, it and he reserved the right to decide which day he would close that stretch of river road. But it made it faster to get to the station, and, and perhaps, may I say, uh, faster for him to get away from his perfectly horrible wife, um, uh, head off to New York, uh, if he had that straight road and didn't have to twist and turn uh, on Ryan Road. In any event, uh, I can remember uh, Mrs. Delano telling me uh, when I was young, uh, she was in a perfect state because she said that she had just gone down to New York uh, the day before uh, and, uh, and your cousin Vincent took it upon himself to choose that day to close River Road and, uh, and I didn't know it and so I missed the train <laughs> having to back up and go down Ryan Road. <laughs> I think that with, the, with Vincent Astor's death it, it must have just been conveyed to the uh, state. But in any event, Vincent may have may have thought of that and said, well, this is something that I can do to make this station more usable uh, to the people of Rhinebeck. <clears throat> I have a, a lifelong attachment to the station as it was the only, it was the one that my family usually used traveling between Rokeby and the city. The eagerly awaited conductor's cry, Rhinecliff, Rhinecliff, station stop Rhinecliff, ferry to Kingston, resonates in my memory. I am so pleased that the State Department of Transportation using federal grant funds and Amtrak have done a fine and sensitive job in rehabbing the building in recent years after it had fallen into a state of sad and indeed dangerous disrepair. The viaduct and the pedestrian crossing have also thankfully been restored. All involved deserve our warmest gratitude. How appropriate it is that the station became listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1990 when it was identified as a contributing element in the Hudson River National Historic Landmark District established by the Secretary of the Interior, and for which HRH is the proud and attentive steward. For a number of years, it has now been owned by Dutchess County, as is the Poughkeepsie Station, I believe. CSX Railroad owns the tracks and the platforms. For the record, last year, this station's revenues were $5.4 million, 
and ridership was 184,452. Passenger rail is not fading, at least not here. This is not the place to discuss Grand Central Terminal's extraordinary design and history as one of the truly great civilized and ingenious buildings in the world. Suffice it to say that its role in the U.S. Supreme Court case 35 years ago that upheld the New York City Landmarks Commission ruling preventing Penn Central Corporation from largely destroying it, as had happened 15 years before at Penn Station, essentially empowered municipal historic preservation ordinances throughout the country as well as preserving Grand Central itself. This iconic building is owned by New York State and has been meticulously restored and to some degree effectively repurposed by the MTA. And I had the great privilege of, of uh, working with the people, the architects and the engineers who were doing the rehab some years ago in my role as the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer uh, because it was a, a public uh, act action that was being taken and a landmark building. Um, and I can tell you, uh, we looked over their shoulder very, very carefully, but we didn't need to worry. I mean, they wanted to, Bayer Blinder Bell, the architects, wanted to do uh, a first-rate job, and they did. It is a model of what is possible, an urban triumph, and as it happens, highly productive in lease revenues. But alas, it is no longer our terminal for upstate and long-distance travel. I will mention here in passing Albany's magnificent Union Station, derelict and isolated from its tracks for a generation, and finally rescued and restored as a bank headquarters, and Buffalo's truly astonishing central terminal built in 1929 on a huge scale in a marvelous modern style in the middle of immense rail yards and incorporating an office tower which was to serve as the new corporate headquarters of the New York Central Railroad at the halfway point in their system between Boston and St. Louis. But the crash and the depression changed all that. It's now in the hands of a small, valiant nonprofit slowly repairing a generation of disuse and vandalism and finding reuses for a relic from the golden age of railroading. In closing, as Red Hook historian, I would be remiss if I did not speak briefly about Barrytown and Tivoli. These stations, which you saw illustrated in Bernie's show, thanks to Claudine lending a couple of postcards uh, to him, um, these stations, like that at Stottsburg, saw local passenger and freight service discontinued in or about 1960, and the decorative wooden frame stations and freight houses promptly demolished. Not long after that, the third and fourth tracks were taken up and the signal towers at the two stations removed. I well recall the Barrytown station to which I would occasionally take a local train and from which I could walk on private roads through Sylvania, the Chapman place, and up the hill to Rokeby. The freight house was across the tracks, the signal tower a few hundred feet to the south. The towers at Barrytown and Tivoli were essential for in between lay the only two-track section in the Hudson Division, crossing the Tivoli Bays. And the necessity of adequate traffic control and associated sidings on this otherwise four-track system was obvious. And I spoke earlier of the difficulty in, in fact, building the trackage across the bays. Next to the Barrytown station was the post office, sharing quarters with a little convenience store. The grade crossing at Barrytown <clears throat> was the site of an accident <coughs> that cost the life of Warren Delano in September 1920, the only time Barrytown's name appeared in a headline on the front page of the New York Times above the center fold. Uh, what happened was he, went, he was a, very much of a horseman, and he'd taken a, a skittish new young horse uh, and a, a phaeton or a light carriage uh, from his property, uh, uh, Steen Valley, she's now called uh, Atalanta, belongs to Mr. Sosnoff, um, down to Barrytown to pick up a house guest's uh, trunk or something, and um, picked up the trunk. And there was, a, there was a local train idling at the station <coughs> on the far track, I guess. And he wanted, he wanted to teach his horse not to be scared of the iron horse. And so he sort of, he sort of directed the horse and the carriage sort of near the near the. I mean, it was a stupid thing to do, near the train. What he didn't know was there was a southbound express, and the noise made by that idling locomotive 
he didn't know it was, and, and why the station master didn't run out and say, get, get out of there, I don't know. And this thing came, it was invisible to him, because as you know, if you've been to Barrytown, there's a bridge and a curve, and you can't see southbound trains at all uh, easily. Uh, and it, 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 it hit his carriage, he was thrown and broke his neck, the horse was killed. Um, catastrophe. Well, so it was the front page of the New York Times the next day. His nephew, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, was vacationing at Campobello Island, and that was the subhead, F.D. Roosevelt, to return for services. They were Unitarians, at least the Delanos were, and so the, it was just going to be a funeral at the house. I'm sorry, Fred, that it wasn't an Episcopal service, uh, uh, or I should say Richard at the, the Church of the Messiah, but uh, uh, in any event, if you stop and think, what was Franklin Roosevelt doing in Campobello in September of 1920? He was in the middle of his campaign for Democratic Vice Presidency of the United States. He was taking a very long summer vacation out of the country. Can you imagine such a thing? And as soon as the funeral was over, he went back to Campobello. Uh, wouldn't happen today. The second most exciting moment at this station occurred about 1958 when the legendary 20th Century Limited cooled its heels at Barrytown while a hot box was attended to. The community buzzed around the famous observation car and its impatient occupants like flies drawn to a roadkill. <laughs> Tivoli, like Rhinecliff, was something of a transportation hub as its station was similarly across from a ferry slip, in this case with service running to Saugerties. The ferry was discontinued in 1938. The Kingston Ferry here was killed off by the Rhinecliff Bridge in 1958. I will now subside. Thank you very much. My name is Larry Lalaberte. I'm a member of the Hudson Valley Railroad Society. Uh, Warren contacted me about a month and a half ago, or two months, to see if we could come up with a speaker. I got volunteered. I've never done a presentation before, so this is new to me and new to everybody else. Okay, we're going to take a trip up to Hudson. Uh, stories of little known facts of railroads along the Hudson River, New York City to uh, Rhinecliff. You might wonder what brewing has to do with uh, the railroads. Uh, next slide. In 19, yep, 1936, Vassar built his second brewery in Poughkeepsie to meet the demand for his product. This was the fourth with others located in New York City and Lansingburg, New York, near Albany. That year, also saw the Hudson experience a hard freeze that closed navigation for an extended period of time. This impacted Vassar's ability to receive raw materials or ship his product to locations as far away as the Caribbean. He lobbied the state legislature to charter the Hudson River Railroad, which was granted. He was elected its vice president in 1847. Construction began with the first station located at Chambers Street in New York City. Construction reached Poughkeepsie in December of 1849, and when the ice cleared, the railroad provided passage on a river steamer to Albany, while the remainder of the trackage was laid. Construction was completed to Albany in 1851. Due to the amount of smoke and noise, an act was passed in 1854 to exclude steam below 42nd Street. This caused the construction of the new terminal at 42nd Street. This station opened in 1871 and was supposed to handle traffic for the next 50 years. You can see this is the second, uh, the first Grand Central. Construction still going on. Next slide. It's another shot of it. Look at the um, corner here. There's nothing there. So when they say it was built out in the boonies, they were pretty much right. 
<laughs> Next terminal. Okay. 30 years after its opening, the station had to be rebuilt to accommodate the increase in traffic, which in two years jumped from 280 trains a day to 505 trains a day. Smoke and noise again created problems, so in 1903, steam operations below the Harlem River were prohibited. This brought about the current terminal. Reed and Stem were awarded the original contract, but nepotism showed up and uh, Warren and Wetmore came into the picture. Moving across the uh, river, a little bit north. The New York West Shore Buffalo Railroad was chartered in 1881. This railroad was backed by the Pennsylvania Railroad and was built to compete with Vanderbilt's New York Central and Hudson River Railroad. A fair war ensued. To retaliate, Vanderbilt started construction of the South Penn to compete with the Pennsylvania Railroad. This was never completed. The New York Central acquired the West Shore after it went bankrupt in 1885. I'm also a uh, postal historian and collector and postcard collector, so you can see a lot of stuff included here. Iona Island, across the Hudson from Camp Smith, has a varied history. The island hosted a small amusement park and a vineyard before its acquisition by the U.S. Navy in 1900. An explosion occurred in 1903 when 13-inch shells detonated, causing the destruction of several buildings, killing six and injuring 11, uh, 10. Windows in Peekskill, three miles away, were shattered. You can see Iona Island here as a naval reserve. It's just south of the Bear Mountain Bridge. Okay. This is a uh, track blueprint of the island in 1944. At the outbreak of World War II, a friend's uncle was a station master on the island. One of his duties was to record the passage of trains. When he went to the uh, recruiting station, he was questioned about his civilian job and he described the above. His military assignment turned out to be on Iona Island, recording passage of trains, <laughs> and with such an important position, uh, he had all of the gas ration books that he could use uh, to the point where he used it as padding under his rug at home. <laughs> Another point was his brother had to sell his car because he could get gas. <laughs> okay. West Point Foundry. Uh, most people know the West Point Foundry as the producers of the Parrot gun or rifles during the Civil War. In actuality, it was much more. It was founded in 1818 to provide artillery to the Army and Navy after the difficulty of obtaining artillery for the War of 1812. This is a bill for castings sent to Poughkeepsie in 1831. You can see the freight to Poughkeepsie there. Okay. The foundry built some of the early steam engines. In 1831, the foundry built the DeWitt Clinton for the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad. The following year, it supplied the same railroad with the experiment designed by John Jervis, who later worked on the Hudson River Railroad, as uh, he was chief engineer. It was found to have an undersized coal-burning boiler. It was rebuilt with a wood-burning boiler and renamed the Brother Jonathan. This engine was the first to incorporate a bogey or pivoting front truck, which allowed it to attain speeds of 60 miles an hour. Prior to that, most engines were on a solid frame and didn't have any movement. Okay. This is a map of Cold Spring uh, around 1867. It shows the extent of the foundry. It had its own railroad to move supplies and product. It also had a 600-foot dock. Uh, other products included panels for flat iron buildings, marine engines, including the engines of the CSS Virginia, lighthouse components, and consumer products. It also produced two 11-inch Dahlgren guns used on the USS Monitor. This is what the foundry looked like around 1865. Note the observation tower here. 
They used to shoot at crow's nests for test out the artillery. The Foundry's tank engine is pulling a New York Central and Hudson River flat car with two 22,000 pound castings. This car suggests that there was a direct rail connection to the Hudson River Railroad. The foundry closed in 1911, as did many foundries in the East due to the development of the industry in the Midwest. Car ferry service to, uh, between Newburgh and Beacon. Several efforts to build a docks at Beacon were undertaken. After much landfill and something like 300 pilings, it was finally accomplished. Uh, it was at Dennings Point at the New York and New England Railroad com completed the construction of their facility on the east shore of the Hudson at, in Beacon. The New York, Lake Erie, and w w <coughs> Western built the facilities on the Newburgh side. That's from the Library of Congress, a stereo view. Uh, let's see. Uh, service commenced in 1882 with the use of a tug and barge that lasted only a few weeks. Uh, only a few years prior to this, the New York, Lake Erie, and uh, Western completed the conversion from a six foot gauge to a standard four foot eight and a half. The William T. Hart was the uh, car ferry used by the, uh, for the service across the river. It could not carry passengers because Homer Ramsdale held a king's charter for local business. New York and New England passengers going to Newburgh on business were obliged to derail at Fishkill Landing, walk over a thousand feet from the depot to the ferry landing at the end of the long wharf and take the local ferry to Newburgh. Through passengers could stay on the cars. In 1892, the Dutchess County Railroad opens it connecting between the Poughkeepsie Bridge and Hopewell Junction, creating a slightly less direct but more efficient route to New, to New England. By 1901, most freight service was going over the bridge. We've had a few accidents on the uh, Hudson River line. Chelsea, 1906. Pacific Express with 14 cars encounters a mudslide and comes up the loser and derails. The engineer and fireman were killed, 15 people were seriously injured, and 30 to 40 received minor injuries. The New Hamburg. Just note the quality of this woodcut for later reference. February 1871 saw a record-breaking cold spell. A 25-car oil train leaves Greenbush for New York City. At the same time, we have the second Pacific Express leaving New York City for Buffalo. As the oil train exited the New Hamburg Tunnel, an axle broke, causing the train to derail and come to a stop on the northbound track at the drawbridge. The engineer of the oil train, realizing that the train had been separated, brought his train to a halt and quickly set out warning lights. According to the news reports, the engineer of the northbound train was probably blinded by the headlight of the stopped engine, but applied the brakes to no avail. The passenger train collided with the derailed oil cars, setting them ablaze. Uh, three sleeper cars were consumed by fire, 19 people died. And in September 1892, a three-car newspaper RPO train jumped the open drawbridge in New Hamburg killing three and injuring 15. <clears throat> Kipsey Locomotive Factory. In 1838, the Family Magazine boasted that this factory could produce 70 to 100 locomotives a year. They produced only one. The factory closed in that year's panic. That loco, shown here on the inset, it was there, uh, was ultimately shipped to the Long Island Railroad and became their number four. This 1873 photo shows the original station that was built around 1849. The engine is the second number 20. Note the roundhouse in the back that is now a parking lot. The Reynolds building there uh, is now the home to Mahoney's and several other uh, establishments. Note also the hopper cars uh, in the front. 
here that contain either coal or iron ore. There were several foundries in operation in Poughkeepsie, including Adrian's Platt, Lane Brothers, and Moline Plow. This is a postcard of the new station built around 1914. It is still there, but elevated Route 9 passes in front of it. Harvey Eastman was a founder of the uh, Eastman Business College, was one of the first to envision a railroad bridge across the Hudson at Poughkeepsie in 1871. A request for a charter to build a bridge was introduced in the state legislature. It got support. Uh, provisions were included for pedestrians and team traffic, i.e. horse and buggy. The original bridge was envisioned as a suspension span with no piers in the river, a concession to the rivermen. Vanderbilt also opposed the bridge because he controlled the bridge across crossing at Albany. After it was determined that the suspension bridge was not feasible, Eastman ran for and was elected to the state assembly to get passage of an amended charter to allow placement of up to four piers in the river. This change also required construction to commence before December 31, 1873. After putting together financing, much from the Pennsylvania Railroad, the cornerstone stone was laid on December 17, 1873. The Panic of 1873 brought all work to a, a halt soon after the Cornerstone Lane. In 1875, the company was reorganized through the efforts of Harvey Eastman, again, but without any Pennsylvania Railroad influence. The American Bridge Company was chosen to build the bridge and work restarted in 1877. With the death of Eastman and the bankruptcy of the Bridge Company in 1879, work again came to a halt. Third attempt bore fruit. In 1886, construction commenced, and the first train to cross the bridge was in December 1888. Unfortunately, it had nowhere to go, the original bridge to nowhere. In 1889, the Hudson Connecting Railroad was formed to build a link from the bridge to the Maybrook and Campbell Hall. The Eastern Connection didn't fare much better. The bridge company, while it was being built, it was dependent on the Poughkeepsie and Eastern, uh, who were planning to connect with the bridge. But they went bankrupt, being taken over by the New York and Massachusetts Railroad, who were not so friendly. Uh, so the Poughkeepsie Bridge Company had to form its own. New York and Mass Railroad, uh, nope, the Poughkeepsie and Connecticut, that roughly paralleled the New York and Mass Railroad to Silvernails in Columbia County. Uh, on May 22, 1889, the bridge finally opened to through traffic. Uh, bridge rebuilding. The increase in both traffic and the weight of trains necessitated the reinforcing of the bridge in 1893 and again in 1918. The difference in appearance in the stereo view on the left, taken shortly after the bridge was completed, and the photo on the right, taken in 1938, both show the first pier in the river on the east shore. You can see the difference. Between 1897 and 1904, the New Paltz and Highland Traffic Company provided service to Poughkeepsie over the bridge using a small dinkier dummy engine. That trolley would end its run at the station on Parker Avenue. And yes, it was a converted residence. The National Police Gazette reported in its May, uh, November 9th, 1888 issue that Steve Brody survived the jump from the as yet incomplete railroad bridge. The feat was witnessed by a Gazette reporter. The Gazette was printed on pink paper and can only be described today as a mix of Sports Illustrated and a supermarket tabloid. The Gazette was noted for its fine woodcuts. As you can see, the difference between this one and the one on the New Hamburg uh, accident. From 1895 to 1949, the intercollegiate regattas were held on the Hudson River at Poughkeepsie. They were so popular that the West Shore Railroad outfitted flat cars with bleachers for paying customers. 
the train would follow the races up and down the river, which ended about a mile south of the bridge. For 30 years, Mike Bogo, a tavern owner, would announce the winning team by setting off fireworks from the railroad bridge. If the winning team was in lane three, he would set off three bombs. Note the gauntlet track in, uh, behind him, uh, the layout of the tracks. That's this area here. This was used only for that portion of the bridge over the river. To show how popular the races were, just look at this 1896 photo. And it all came to an end after when a financially troubled Penn Central deferred maintenance on the bridge. This included the water line, which was designed to fight fires, froze and was not repaired. In May of 1874, a passing freight caused that fire to end service. Okay. In March of 1912, five cars of southbound 20th Century Limited derailed half a mile south of the Hyde Park Station. The thick ice prevented any of the cars from entering the river, and no one was seriously injured. Okay. My favorite picture of the wreck is the one on top here. You can see the ice boat in the back. You can see the rail that was uh, ripped off and the, the ties where it came from. A little note on that one, you had a uh, souvenir hunter by the name of uh, Theodore Fredericks who tried to take a piece of the rail home with him, but he was caught by a local detective. <laughs> okay, this is the original station built in 1850. It was replaced in 1914 because of the expansion of four tracks required, requiring its demolition. The current station was built 20 feet east of, this, of the original. This is a photograph of uh, FDR crossing the tracks. He was paralyzed in 1921. He used the Hyde Park Station frequently when he was governor. His paralysis made it impossible to use the tunnel to cross the tracks that most people used. When he was president, FDR would, more often than not, derail in Highland on the West Shore and motorcade over to his estate. Because of the motive power changes, and switching required to come up the east side. It was faster to come up the west shore. He also did a lot of his own train movement planning. He could do it by memory. He was that into railroads. This is a photo of the station in the 1930s. The tunnel mentioned before is right here. This is the west side uh, for southbound traffic. Uh, it also had a little bit of a shelter for protect passengers. This is a photo of the ticket booth as it appeared in the 1930s. Remember what it looks like for later reference. In June of uh, 1939, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth visited FDR and had their famous hot dog picnic. They departed from Hyde Park Station to continue their tour uh, Canada and the U.S. aboard their special train, the Royal Blue. These photos show the unloading of FDR's casket after his demise and its movement up the hill to the Rose Garden for interment. The town board had to hold a special meeting to allow the burial on the estate. The entire ceremony took only 45 minutes. President Truman boards the train for a trip back to uh, D.C. The funeral train was made up of two sections because of all the high-ranking government officials, which included the entire Supreme Court. The last passenger train to stop at the Hyde Park station occurred in 1958. Shortly after, it was transferred to the town of Hyde Park. It stood idle for a while and began to be vandalized. At some point, it was boarded up, as can be seen here. That didn't stop some youth from entering, as you can see here. It was illegally used for storage, and major damage occurred during this period. 
1972, a group from Franklin Delano Roosevelt High School received permission from the town board to rehabilitate the station and use it as an after-school meeting place. After about two years, the one con and one concert held at the station to raise money. The effort fell apart and the station again became derelict. You can see there's no doors, no windows, and here it was all taken apart. 1975, the station faced imminent demolition. Uh, the, we, the Hudson Valley Railroad Society, then a modeling club, convinced the board to allow the club to rehab the station and use it as a clubhouse. The town board agreed to lease the station for a dollar a year as long as the town didn't incur any costs. This photo of the ticket booth shortly after some cleanup work. You can see the ticket booth's gone. And this is the station as it looks pretty much today. IBM provided a grant to replace the windows, doors, and place new signage so that the station looked good for the special press train that was planned for the premiere of Eleanor and Franklin. The premiere took place at the Roosevelt Theater. Rhinecliff wreck. This wreck occurred in Rhinecliff 1935. Other than that, I don't have much information. <laughs> I'm still hunting. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a couple of uh, postcard views of Rhinecliffe that I wanted to throw in, past and present. Okay. And some special trains on the uh, Hudson Line. You have the Lincoln Funeral Train, 1865, traveled up the Hudson on its way to Springfield, Illinois. The Eastman College Band played dirges on the train as it traveled from Poughkeepsie to Albany. The debut of the streamlined Empire State Express was supposed to headline many newspapers. Unfortunately, the date chosen for the debut was December 7th, 1941. That kind of uh, got sidelined. A uh, special press train, as mentioned before, sponsored by IBM for the premiere of TV special Eleanor and Franklin at the Roosevelt Theater. And many scenes of Hello, Dolly! were filmed at the Garrison and Poughkeepsie train stations in uh, 1968. And if you wanted to be a railroad policeman, you had to uh, get the governor's approval. And this is a letter sent to the governor for the commissioning of, uh, oh, I can't, William McCabe. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed the little trip. River um, from uh, Larry, um, both sides, foundries and development and so forth, and um, some of the reasons why there was development in addition to just the, uh, the, the various towns and cities. And we heard um, a little bit about the history of um, people on the river from wind. And I'm going to talk, uh, an architect, so I'm going to talk about architecture. Um, New York, I'm sorry, yeah, yep. New York, New York um, Central, as we talked about earlier, um, commissioned a lot of new stations when they four-tracked the line going from New York City to Albany. And, um, but, but they had a whole station building program in general. And so I'm going to talk about the, um, the New York Central stations, not just of Warren and Wentmore, but from other architects as well, and just give you a little history into sort of why station architecture evolved the way it did from the late uh, 1800s through, well, really, probably through today. So with that, um, a very significant influence on commercial architects, architects in general in this country, uh, at the end of the, la of the, not the last century anymore, two centuries ago, the end of the 19th century was the um, Chicago World's Fair of 1893, which is actually called the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Um, and, and what it was significant for, it created a, a huge World's Fair campus of sort of neoclassical buildings. And uh, so much so, all with uh, columns and arcades and so forth, it was called the Great white city. Uh, most of it probably wasn't um, white marble, it was probably plaster, stucco, other things, but it became a real um, 
a real impetus in this sort of city beautiful movement that Daniel Burnham of Chicago, as a leading architect there, um, sort of espoused and 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 it uh, spread and sort of across the country. But again, it's it a lot of the stations you're going to see grew out of people emulating this this style of architecture in the uh, few decades following that World's Fair. Here, just another image from the time of the World's Columbian Exposition. You can see there were lots of water features, a lot of um, parterres, planted areas, and again, uh, arches and columns as far as the eye could see with domes at key points, all very um, key classical references. Okay. Uh, one more view, um, bridges, um, lots of balustrades, just giving you the flavor of that. It was very, very... Um, inspiring and it sort of was um, uh, as, as the United States was sort of coming out of its um, obviously post-colonial period but sort of the mid-century and a very eclectic period of architecture where people would pull influences from all kinds of different styles you know we had Egyptian and this and that and the other um, this was really kind of focusing it again on classicism and one of the interesting things about the style is that you can wrap an arcade of columns around anything and hide anything behind it. And so, when it, it, and it's something that sort of modern architects have, have discovered too, is that you, you, can, you can take a certain wrapper and fit a very complex program behind it. And so, as a, uh, a volume to contain the complex things that have to go on a station with people and vehicles and trains and um, lots of different things coming together, um, it actually served that purpose very well. So. So we all know uh, the sort of magnum opus of uh, Warren and Wetmore with Reed and Stem, and as someone noted, it was actually Reed and Stem with Warren and Wetmore, but they were they were brought along. Was of course Grand Central Station, and this is one of the original um, elevation drawings of it with some uh, notations and so forth. But um, it's it's a, still a magnificent structure, and uh, probably the fact that it exists at all is because uh, Penn Station, Pennsylvania Railroad, was torn down, and that sort of galvanized the uh, preservation movement in New York City. But anyway, um, next please. Um, obviously an image um, of the time based on the vehicles, you can always tell. And then a more recent image um, where it's sort of um, disfigured with the uh, Pan Am building behind it, which is now the MetLife building or something else. But um, the building still survives and has been beautifully restored. And uh, it's, it's really one of the great landmarks of New York City and one of the most visited landmarks in New York City by tourists from all over the world. Uh, but but um, if we consider where the New York Central Line went uh, and, the, and the major stations along its route, um, obviously everyone, everything went through Albany and then it split and you could connect through lines. You could go to Boston or you could go out to Buffalo and Chicago and St. Louis. But this was a postcard from um, the time this station was new. Many stations are called Union Station. And as uh, Wynn noted, a Union Station was simply a station that several different train lines shared. There were many that didn't like to share lines and they had their own stations. But you'll see in in city after city, city, there's a union station or union terminal because it was obviously um, joining several different lines. This is a very uh, classically composed building. Um, you, you see that Shepley, Rutten, and Coolidge did a lot of other stations as well. You'll see some later. So they, they and Warren and Wetmore were doing a lot of stations in the Northeast. So they were based in Boston. Uh, next. Um, just a view of it uh, now, as uh, Wint noted, renovated as a bank. Uh, most of the tracks, I think, were taken up for 787 and some of the, uh, the vehicular carters along the river there. But a uh, very handsome building, and it's great that it was, uh, that it was saved and, and rehabbed for another use, even if it's not quite as grand a use. Just another view of the overall building. Um, this is, of course, in downtown Albany, and next, the uh, current station for Albany is, in fact, across the river in Rensselaer. Um, to their credit, when this station was built um, in 2002, they did try to introduce a few notes of grandeur. Um, you know, as an architect, it's easy for me to sort of criticize it, and I think any time a building has to have a sign that says main entrance, it's like, well, it should be obvious, but maybe the cupola wasn't enough. Um, it's, it's, it's not bad. Uh, for of its time and and you know at least you know you've arrived somewhere even if it's not downtown Albany you've got to get across the bridge next um, going going uh, east from Albany the terminus of the lines was its South Station Boston uh, which has survived and uh, although it has a lot of commuter trains too and you'll see that Shepley Rutten and Coolidge um, designed that as well the same neoclassical plan with pediments and columns balustrades what's interesting about this is the way it wraps around a corner so this sort of the novelty here is that, um, and it's it's uh, still a, a vibrant hub in Boston. There were other stations, but this is the one that I think the New York Central uh, came to. They stopped at Back Bay um, before they ended up here. 
but this was a terminus. Uh, at the other end, um, Chicago, the other main end, interestingly, the New York Central lines went to the LaSalle Street station, not the Union Station, which is a, a finer building. You'll see in a minute. The LaSalle Street station was just all business. The lower level had a terminal building and a waiting room, but you see just offices up above it or hotels or both. Um, so it was, it was, was pretty much a business. But um, in Chicago had a, a number of different stations, and New York Central was not sharing at that time with the other rail lines. So this was where they came into. Um, next, here are a couple of, uh, it was a very hard station to photograph because there was the elevated tracks right in front of it. So you're always getting these oblique views of the, uh, the great arched entrance and then the waiting room there you see on the inside. Um, a great view of um, uh, 20th Century Limited uh, on its way out of Chicago, headed for Grand Central um, in 1947. And a view of, we've talked about it, the 20th century, the observation car at the back with the large windows. And it uh, looks like there's an attendant waiting on someone sitting in the back there. Um, the main station in Chicago, and the one that's, that's um, primarily used now, is Union Station. About the same period, a little bit later, 1913, 1925, Daniel Burnham's firm started it. He died unexpectedly, and uh, Graham Anderson Prost and White took it over. You can see, again, it's a large classical facade with um, arched uh, pavilions at the corner, um, columns, in this case, a little bit more relief here, just windows, pilasters, rather like the post office in New York, and then some office space up above. Um, grand waiting room, very much on the scale of Grand Central Terminal uh, in New York, um, just enormous in scale, a lot of the same elements uh, we were noting over in the Rhinecliff Station, the sort of the rhythm of the shallow arches, segmental arches, and then the, the um, uneven division of the uh, space above it into an ABA rhythm, but although this looks more, more consistent, but it's, uh, it's, it's truly a grand space, and indeed um, Main waiting rooms in city terminals were some of the grandest spaces of their day as public transportation hubs. I mentioned St. Louis. This building a little bit earlier and is clearly not in the neoclassical mode. It's a little more medieval looking. Um, but it was, in fact, at the time it was built, the busiest station in the country. There are 22 rail lines going through there, many, many tracks. And it was had both the largest train shed. I don't have a picture of that. The largest train shed uh, in the world in terms of glass and steel structure. And I, one of the things, again, I, I mentioned over at the Rankless station is that the, the head house, the facade where the waiting rooms were, was just the tip of the iceberg. The, the train sheds, if they were covered, which they were in most stations, were huge. And the idea was just to cover as many tracks as possible without columns and posts. So there were always steel trusses and glass. You see them more in Europe now than you do here. Uh, here, more often things are underground, such as at Penn Station in New York. So uh, en route between Albany and Chicago, there was this amazing Buffalo Central Terminal that Wint mentioned. The, the year 1929 tells it all. Uh, of course, we moved into Art Deco design, which is a very stripped sort of modernistic uh, classicism, trying to evoke the streamlining of vehicles, trains, et cetera, um, and with this incredible tower that sort of becomes an octagon at the top. Um, but the tower was never occupied, and the building hasn't been occupied for some years. There are just a number of other pictures of this building. Um, this is uh, uh, a more recent picture. It looks like uh, based on um, the, the condition that it's not used in this, in this picture and also from the vehicle in the foreground. Here it is. You can see a lot of the windows missing, which is common. I guess they get uh, targets for vandals pretty quickly. This is from the other direction, so you're seeing a long block of offices on the side. Next. Um, the, the waiting room was another stunning space, not as, um, as cool, say, as a Chicago waiting room with the stone. Here you're just seeing a brick, much like the waiting room here at Rhinecliff. But nonetheless, a huge barrel vaulted space, great arches, big windows at the end, flooded with light. Uh, here it is um, more recently. Um, doesn't look a terrible condition here, but um, the, the building has fallen on hard times, and fortunately there is a uh, small group that's working on trying to, uh, to bring it back. Uh, what's interesting about this station, a number of others, is when, when companies wanted to build big stations, you know, they don't want to put it in the middle of a city because it's expensive to acquire the land and it's built up. So they tend to put them out at the edge. And that happened in Buffalo. It happened in Detroit, which we'll see in a minute. Um, and it seems to make sense for a few reasons. First of all, you can acquire the land. You have room for all the rail tracks and yards. Um, and you can encourage development in a new area. But what very often happened was the station was built or the terminal was built and the development never came. And so what happens is now you've got to get out to the station from somewhere, just like going out to an airport. And we take it for granted that airports aren't downtown unless things like Washington National or LaGuardia, but for most part, 
you're used to going out to to an airport, but for train stations, you're used to arriving right downtown. And so once they put it, even if it was just a couple miles away, you had to get a trolley, a bus, a taxi, a private car. And when these were built, they weren't providing a lot of facilities for private cars, even in Detroit. So uh, what's kind of interesting is that, that in a way, I think this may have hastened their demise. If they weren't to a central area and the economy changed, then nobody was going to build out around them. But anyway, uh, another beautiful image from the period, kind of hard to see in the light here, but there's, uh, in addition to the uh, the trains in both directions, the 20th century limited there. Um, up above, there's a plane flying over. Um, they've got just about everything in. But notice the, uh, the platform and the canopies here, which you're going to see again in the next slide. This is the way it looks uh, now. Um, clearly, there's an awful lot to restore, but um, it is a beautiful piece of uh, sort of art deco station architecture. Detroit. But back to Warren and Wetmore and Reed and Stem, uh, they collaborated on this. The Michigan Central Railroad um, built this in 1913. And um, this is a very fuzzy picture, but it's one of the last ones I could find when it still was being used because there are actually vehicles in front of it um, and the windows are intact. If we go to the next station, um, you can see, we well, maybe you can't see so well, but it's, it's um, not in great condition. It's abandoned. There's a fence in front of it. And if you go to the next one, I think it's even more apparent. Um, it's fallen on hard, hard times. Almost all the windows have been smashed. And uh, it's an incredible piece of neoclassical architecture with a sod, those three large arches and pediments in the front with the applied columns. And then in the back, this office tower, which at the time was the tallest train station in the world. I mean, everybody always had bragging rights. Tallest train station in the world, the most office space, so forth and so on. I don't think this was ever fully occupied either. And they, again, expected a lot of development out around this station because it's not right downtown Detroit. And that didn't happen. Um, next. Uh, here was the waiting, main waiting room uh, at the time it was built in 1913. Next. Uh, another um, period photograph of the waiting room. Next. Um, as it is today. Next. And uh, again, it's, uh, w whether it survives, I don't know. It's been called the poster child for derelict buildings in the Midwest. But as we all know, Detroit, having just gone through bankruptcy, <laughs> probably not in a position to do much about it. Here again, there are interested groups that want to sort of bring it back. But you've got to find a use, and you've got to find funding, and you've got to convince people it's worth doing. But as a piece of architecture, it's pretty stunning. Next. Um, Reed and Stem did things without Warren and Wetmore. And one of their really notable buildings is at the far end of the rail line going across the country in Tacoma, Washington. Um, this building was built to great acclaim when it opened in 1911 with these sort of arches in all directions and a huge dome. And uh, there's an interior of the dome. In fact, it's such a popular space in Tacoma, it's used a lot for weddings and other events, and, and why not? Uh, another incredible station um, while we're in the out, out west is the uh, Union Terminal in Cincinnati. Um, it's attributed to Fellheimer and Wagner, but with uh, Philippe Cret. And Philippe Cret was a, a noted Art Deco architect who did a lot of very stylized, streamlined buildings in a sort of a neoclassical mode. And he is really credited as being the designer, uh, whereas uh, Fellheimer and Wagner, who did, who did the Buffalo Central Terminal, um, were sort of the executive architects here. What's amazing about this, again, is it sits at the end of a very landscaped um, approach to it with water cascade um, gardens and then all the trains running at right angles behind it, which is mostly freight here. In fact, it's no longer used, I don't think, for passenger trains. Um, kind of like a radio. It has that sort of feel. Um, here even more. You can just see it sitting on a mantelpiece, perhaps, um, with a clock. But amazing bas relief. I mean, obviously, this is full blown Art Deco. Um, look at the uh, the lights, uh, the columns with lights, and again the water cascading down from it. Uh, next, the interior is is stunning. It it was called, not surprisingly, the largest half sphere in the world. Well, there are probably not so many half spheres out there as interior spaces, but it was a pretty interesting one. And you can see, looking back toward the front entrance, how all those things. Um, inter it's a hard thing to, to photograph, obviously, without a wide-angle lens, but it makes you think of Radio City Music Hall and any other grand spaces of that period. Um, looking the other way, amazing murals. Uh, there was a, a German um, artist who was um, hired to, to paint these murals of the history of the development of um, Ohio and, and the Midwest, and uh, just really remarkable. Oh, so back to Warren and Wetmore. They were busy designing other stations, too. They designed the Union Station in Winnipeg in 1911, which has a dome, but in this case, it's set back in the middle of the building, so the front facade is just the big arch. Next. Um, here it is today, somewhat disfigured by the Via Rail logo. And inside, we have a picture of it as it was originally, great vaulted um, plaster ceilings, arches in all directions. 
and as it is today uh, with the usual um, internally illuminated signage, but nonetheless in pretty good shape and still the pride of Winnipeg. All right, so coming back to the Hudson Line, um, Yonkers has a, uh, um, an urban style station, which is in red brick as opposed to all stone with stone trim, but it, it is somewhat asymmetrical. And so you have a longer wing on the left than you do on the right from the entrance. So that's one nod that it's not a primary big city station. This is kind of a small city station. And the red brick also suggests it's not as grand as Albany or, or Chicago or, or um, Boston. Next. Um, very nice um, entrance through with ticket offices into a waiting room. Um, barrel vaults, again, all rendered in brick here as opposed to in plaster or stone. And then the waiting room um, benches, very similar to the benches uh, at the Rhinecliff Station. Uh, Poughkeepsie is a more symmetrical facade, a center block with symmetrical flanking wings. Um, and, you know, Poughkeepsie's a county seat, was a significant um, city at the time, albeit a small city. So again, we're working in brick as opposed to stone, but they're stone medallions, stone trim. Um, it's a pretty high style station. Next. Again, um, similar benches in the interior, uh, in this case incorporating some lighting. Uh, Newburgh, as far as we can tell, it certainly is very much the same style on the West Shore Railroad. This was designed also by Warren and Wetmore. I don't know why there's a mystery, but I, I, it may be that there's, it's missing from the records of their offices because everyone says it obviously is, but there seems to be a question. Anyway, um, same suspended canopy, brick with stone trim, pilasters, classical vocabulary. Uh, next. That has been restored in recent years, and um, as uh, was noted, there's a, there's a pizza restaurant in it and some other uh, performing space. But asymmetrical, um, so you have the, the entrance with the high sort of waiting room wing originally on the left, and then some offices on the right. So it's, it's, it's deferring to the fact that it's not a big city station, it's a small city station. Um, Hyde Park, um, where's their baggage cart we talked about earlier today? It looks like a milk... Uh, Bottle on it. Um, Warren and Wetmore, same time they were doing the station here in uh, Rhinebeck. And then, of course, the, the Rhinecliff station we, we saw earlier in yellow brick with the Spanish tile roof. Again, a little bit more pretentious, if you will, than the Hyde Park station in red brick. Okay, another view of that. The interior um, we saw on the tour earlier, quite grand for a small town station. Uh, but I think the references here were the country estates, and this one across the river, the uh, Payne Mansion and Esopus with red tile roofs, a um, little more formal classicism, but same sort of vocabulary. That was by Carrera and Hastings, by the way, who did the New York Public Library. And then um, the little gatehouse for that out on the, uh, the main road, which echoes the style of that. I mean, I, I, I think of this as a reference for these sort of small stations. Um, there were a few other stations, very few things that Warren and Wetmore did that were not uh, that neoclassical, but one example is here in Hartsdale. A charming little building, um, a main waiting room, the usual um, variety of things going on at the station, a ticket office, um, it's kind of squeezed into a triangle there, a baggage room. The other way, uh, men's and women's rooms flanking, a uh, carter out to a covered port cochere for drop-off, and then the uh, tracks behind it. Next. Um, here's some older postcards of that station, again, in sort of a, a Tudor style as opposed to neoclassical. Um, 1915, now it's got Starbucks in it too, but I think it still functions as a station. Um, and then one that I like uh, at the very top of the Harlem division line was the um, station in Chatham, Union Station. In fact, Chatham had three or four train lines running through it that crisscross. Um, and this was designed by Shepley, Rutten, and Coolidge, who again inherited the project. Uh, in this case, it was H.H. H. Richardson's office that had a contract to do a series of stations. And when they took over, they pretty much kept with the same style. So it really is sort of a Richardsonian Romanesque building as opposed to a full neoclassical. Uh, that's a period postcard. And then the next view has it uh, as it is today. Um, the station still stands. It no longer functions as a station. Uh, it is the office of a local bank. Uh, but the tracks are there. Freights go through regularly. And I think once a day, the Lakeshore Limited section that comes from Boston to Albany comes by and then hooks up with the uh, section coming from New York to head out to oh, Chicago. Now, um, I can't end without talking about a building no longer with us, the incredible Pennsylvania Station, New York. Um, it built between 1910 and 1912, and uh, designed by McKim Eden White, and lasted until 1963. Um, this was sort of um, at the outer edge of development, uh, but development kept going, and uh, there was a reservoir, actually, I believe, uh, across the street from it for a long time, before the uh, completion of the Croton Aqueduct and uh, water supply from outside the city. So that was a contemporary rendering. 
Um, next. And just some other images of it. Here is a uh, photo says taken from Gimbel's. Um, here it was, close to the end, based on the, uh, the vehicle on the left there. So this is a very early 60s, just before it was knocked down for the current Madison Square Garden. The incredible main hall, which was back, the, the piece with all the, the, the very high piece in the middle was this. And this was literally modeled on the baths of Caracalla in ancient Rome, with w windows letting in light from up above, because in all other directions there were passageways. There was a very long walkway, as there still is underground, from 7th Avenue to the main waiting room, um, and then another connection across to 8th Avenue, as well as the two side streets. And then this is the train shed, the, the sort of the business end of the train station, with the glass um, paned, uh, you know, steel vaulted, iron vaulted roofs above. What's interesting is if you use Penn Station, you know that a lot of the infrastructure of this part still exists, particularly down below. And the, you can't see in this photograph very well, but the railings, the stairs up from the platforms have the same classical uh, detailing, you know, from the, that were left from when it was built. Um, and that's remained even as the station was sort of destroyed and then um, sort of put into a, a tunnel underneath. Um, Vincent Scully, architectural historian, famously remarked that, you know, when this station existed, one entered New York like a god, and now you scuttle in like a rat. The, um, the, the thought of the, the Moynihan station, which is to relocate or sort of recreate a real Penn station in the post office, um, I believe that's very slowly moving forward. It sort of waxes and wanes. But that is still, still I think, the plan is to create a new, fairly grand um, uh, station in New York for um, Amtrak that used to use the Penn Station in the uh, the next building over, which goes over the tracks anyway. So I mean, it's sort of it's sort of logical. But that's it, and it was just kind of a romp through station architecture. And I think with that, we're going to take a quick break in the back, and then we're going to come back for a presentation about Rhinecliff. But before we do that, I want to note, have you note that um, there are some large photographs of historic pictures of uh, station both in uh, Rhinecliff and Statsburg in the back. And we also have a watercolor of the old Rhinecliff station painted by a local artist, Betsy Jackarusso. And those items are available in an auction. I'm going to ask our auctioneer extraordinaire, Wint Aldrich, to see if anyone can be persuaded to go home with those today. We're going to do that now? You can do that now. We need to expect it. We, we, we've seen all the stations we've heard about and some of the stations that we know. And that last, those last images, one that we mourn and will forever mourn. But you know, the loss of Penn Station has changed the world uh, in terms of urban life uh, because it did motivate the people of the city of New York uh, to create the Landmarks Commission. And they will never let go of it. And it has done a tremendous amount of good there. And because it's happening in New York City, where real estate is God, it has encouraged people all over this country to go and do likewise in their villages and their cities, create local ordinances and commissions to identify and protect what is really fine. So we mourn Penn Station, uh, but we are also very grateful for the lessons that we have learned from it. We have two speakers for this last part of the program today. Um, Jack Conklin, a Rhinebeck resident, and behind me here is going to introduce uh, himself, tell you how long he's been here and what drew him here, et cetera. And then um, he's going to share his time with Joanne Meyer, the librarian from the Morton Memorial Library, which is right up the street and worth a visit if you haven't already seen it. The, the Morton, it's actually Morton Memorial Library and Community Center, and they do a lot of great things, aside from being a wonderful library resource for not just the hamlet of Rhinecliff, but for the town of Rhinebeck. They have a great community room that is used for all kinds of activities, musical productions, um, other kinds of shows. They have art shows. Uh, they have um, uh, cabaret evenings. And for many years, actually, is where the uh, Rhinebeck um, Performing Arts uh, Group would have the um, have plays before they built the Performing Arts Center, so Rhinebeck Theater Society. So. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful local resource, and it's also a beautiful building. It was given to the community by Levi P. Morton, who had a home just a little further south of the hamlet, uh, Ellerslie. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brick building with uh, classical, with a, um, a great porch, and um, really a very, very charming building. But, um, of course, it's a library, and so it deserves our support for that. 
<laughs> not just because it's a beautiful building. But with that, I'm going to start by giving the mic to Jack Conklin, and then when he's had his say, we're going to turn it over to Joanne. Thank you, Warren. Uh, I live here in Ron Cliff. I've been here uh, since 1987, 20, going on 27 years. Um, you can hear? No. Now you can hear. Okay, we'll try to uh, keep that focused. Uh, a little background, I grew up in Dutchess County uh, on a dairy farm down in Pleasant Valley, spent 10 years in the Army, uh, worked as an engineer with Procter & Gamble, came back to Dutchess County, and retired here to Runcliffe. Okay. Now, when you approached Rhinecliffe from the north, you'll see this sign. Welcome to Rhinecliffe, Kipsbergen, 1686. Really a tale of two little communities. If you go to the right, you come down to the train station, and that's the road that uh, Wint talked about. That uh, wasn't there until 1911, 1912, something like that. To the left is Orchard Street, the main drag through Rhinecliffe. Okay. What I'm going to talk about today is um, the early Dutch history on the influence not only of Kipsbergen, because they were Dutch, but the whole Hudson Valley and indeed uh, the U.S. There are three families that we're going to talk about. We'll get into the whole patent process, that of uh, land distribution. The Beekman and Livingston estates greatly affected Rhinecliffe. In fact, they took up almost 60% of the land area. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, economics, Kipsbergen and the river. Then comes Charles Russell. This is the railroad era. He was um, on the board of directors. Uh, we'll see how that develops. You've already heard about Vanderbilt and the New York Central, and we'll top it off with Rhinecliffe today. The Dutch influence. There's a book called The Island at the Center of the World, published uh, not too long ago, 2004, by uh, Russell Shorto. The epic story of the Dutch Manhattan and the forgotten colony that shaped America. A little too strong maybe, but essentially correct. The Dutch had a major, major influence on this whole area. And uh, when we get to Kipsbergen, we're going to talk then about the Dutch. The Golden Age. Let me, uh, let me stay there on the Golden Age. Um, Holland in this century, half century, the Dutch were the preeminent uh, country in this period, competing with the Spanish, competing with the English, but uh, the Dutch developed or invented or whatever a merchant ship that they called the Flute, which gave them a a uh, great advantage in the world of trade. It could sail faster, it could hold more freight, it didn't need as much crew, and they uh, dominated the commercial world. They were also very tolerant. They brought people in from uh, all over Europe that were being whatever, persecuted or whatever. The French Huguenots, um, in, in 1610, it uh, is reported that there were more foreigners in Amsterdam than there were Dutch. They opened up their arms to literally everybody. And you'll see it's going to affect uh, Runcliffe. I want to talk a little bit about Henry Hudson. He's right in the middle of this golden era of Holland. He's an Englishman in the employ of the Dutch East India Company, not West, East. He's looking for the Northeast Passage to India. He starts, he's, he's tried twice, he's failed. In 1609, 
He lands up near Maine, works his way all the way down to the Chesapeake Bay, and by September 9th, he's in New York Harbor. On the 15th, he sails up here, and he's right off part was that he encountered chiefs, their wives, and uh, two of their daughters, 16 and 17 year old daughters, uh, aboard ship for a meal. They exchanged some gifts and uh, got along very well. Sixty years later, the Dutchmen from Kingston are going to be negotiating with, this, with the descendants of these very friendly people. Um, Going back to New York, he uh, runs into hostile natives and really has to fight his way back. He, they, they discharge cannons and whatever. And a piece of trivia, the first European killed in the Hudson Valley was a man by the name of John Coleman who took an <coughs> arrow through his throat. He's buried off of Sandy Hook in a place called Coleman's Point. So if you need a little trivia, when you go down that way, that's him. Okay. I want to talk about three families, their history, and how they affected our little hamlet of Rhinecliffe. The Kipps, the Beekmans, and the Livingstons. All right, let's start with the Kipps. Hendris Kipp is the, uh, arrives in New York City, 1637, roughly 20 years after the uh, first fort was set up down there. By the way, uh, I neg neglected to mention, the, the Dutch followed up immediately uh, on Hudson's exploration. By uh, 1614, they had a um, trading post in Manhattan. They were up in Albany by 1615, 1618, or right across the river over here in Kingston. Wasn't called Kingston then, but, but the, the Dutch were after trade. They weren't here for religious purposes. They didn't even build their church for 20 years after uh, they arrived. So H Hendrik Skip is one of the uh, first uh, to arrive. He's got three sons. The one we're interested in is Isaac. Uh, because he was a sloop captain, moved back and forth between Albany, Kingston, and New York. And um, Hendricks was a alderman, Schleppen, I think they called it. Jacobus was a secretary to the uh, uh, company. The, uh, by, then, by now, in uh, 1621, it became the West India Company. Uh, he's a brewer. He has large estates in, uh, in Manhattan. In fact, uh, Kipps Bay is named. show up in Rhinecliffe. Yeah. 
All right, let's go to the big ones. Ten years after the Kips arrives Wilhelm William Beekman. He's on the same ship, the same boat over as uh, Peter Stevenson, and he is in the employ of the company, the Dutch West Indy Company. And he acts as sort of a troubleshooter. He's sent down to uh, the Delaware in, in 1658 to settle some disputes uh, with that company, that uh, colony. And then he's sent up to uh, Wiltcliffe, Kingston, where he becomes uh, a shout or a sheriff. And he has his family, raises his family in Kingston. He has uh, his son, the judge, uh, becomes, uh, he's elected to the Continental Congress. Uh, he marries a local merchant's daughter. Uh, he um, uh, becomes judge of the whole territory south of Albany all the way down to New York, a very powerful position. And he starts to buy land. You're going to see him develop in our story. He has three children. Or he has more, but three that are of interest to us. Colonel Henry, who marries Janet Livingston. She dies at the age of 21 with one daughter, Margaret. He marries again a Gertrude uh, Van Cortland. Van Cortland Park a hundred and some thousand acres come with that dowry, that marriage. Cornelia marries a Gilbert Livingston. Uh, I have some relatives from that line. Cornelia and Gilbert's son, Henry, marries a Conklin way back in 1750-something. Catherine marries first an Exvin. I don't know much about him. Rustin and Pauling, and you'll see their names all over this area. This will all show up later. Okay, now comes the Livingstons. Dutch, you say? No, Livingston was a Scot. His father was a uh, Presbyterian minister, uh, moves to Holland to get away from the, well, I guess he was asked to leave. Uh, he had heterical views in the uh, uh, ch church. Um, the son, Robert, uh, arrives in Holland at age 10. He becomes fluent in the Dutch language. Uh, he comes to the United States or to the colonies at age 20. He moves up to Albany where he's secretary to the Vance uh, Rensselaer patroon, speaking English, speaking Dutch. He does very well. He does exceptionally well when he marries a Lydia. Lydia is the widow of Van Rensselaer. Uh, one of the Nicholas Van Rensselaer, one of the largest and uh, landholders there. Livingston does his own buying of uh, uh, land. Will end up with uh, most of uh, Columbia County. Uh, the, uh, the manor house is at Claremont. We'll get into that later. Philip, Gilbert, and Robert. He passes over Philip and deeds Claremont to Robert. There's Gilbert who married Cornelia Beekman from the other chart. Robert, there's Janet, his daughter, who marries Henry Beekman from the other chart. And they have a son, Robert, who marries their daughter. Convoluted. Now, um, Robert, Edmund, John, and Henry are the uh, males of the family, but the, but the daughters are going to play a big role in Kipps Bergen. Uh, a little bit about Robert. He, uh, at his time, was one of the most 
uh, powerful, influential men in the country. He was on the uh, Congressional Committee to uh, write the Constitution. He was uh, called Chancellor. He was head of the uh, judicial system in the state of New York. He's an ambassador. He swears in George Washington, a president, painting of him in uh, New York City. Um, he's an ambassador to uh, France. He meets Fulton in France, so Fulton was trying to sell his steamboat to Napoleon. He makes a deal to bring the steam engine back, uh, works with uh, Fulton. Fulton marries a Livingston, has nothing to do with Ryan Cliff. Okay, next. The land grant process, about 1650, um, it was decided that there, were, there should be a, a disciplined approach to buying land. And it went something like this. You notified uh, the authorities that you had intent to uh, negotiate with the Indians. You developed uh, an Indian deed, paid them. They then did some surveying and then it went back to Europe for final approval. And along the way, you're paying fees and whatever. The usual purchase was a quit rent, usually in bushels of wheat, sometimes not. But, we, and aside, Henry Beekman never paid his for years, and it was in, a, 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 in arrears for like 50 years, and they finally uh, had to pay up with this, so many bushels of wheat. But the, the very first land grant went to the Kips. This is this is four miles of riverfront. Uh, his partners were Rusa, Elting, and Aronson. They never settled here. They were only interested in selling the land. And his brother, uh, Henry, Jan, split the land. And so do these people. One, two, three, they divvy up the land. Rusa, Elting, Aronson, etc. These will eventually all be sold to the Livingstons. The back of the 2,200 acres is the creek line. Back up here, uh, going into uh, Rhinebeck, you'll go across the little stream. It's the, uh, the Rhine Cliff. It runs into the Landsman Kill, runs down to the river. These were very valuable mill sites. Went mentioned that there were some stone houses, and we'll get to those in a bit. But the first house built was Henry Kipp. <coughs> Uh, the house looked like that on the, on the bottom uh, left. That's the Rhinebeck Post Office. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, as president, had a great deal of influence in the design of that. He wanted that post office to represent the oldest house in his county. That's what the house uh, looked like here in an early photograph. It's the before it was expanded. There's a marker right outside of uh, Rhinecliff that talks about the KIPP. You'll see KIPP, uh, Beekman, they left out Livingston, and Hermance. Hermance married one of KIPP's offspring, so it comes back to that. All that's left today is that uh, brick uh, stone column out in the fields. Okay. Now, here come the stone houses that uh, went mentioned. Henry's son, Henry, builds this one on the uh, lower left, uh, 1715, I think. Uh, I'll get into that later. Um, J Jacob builds the house down near Long Dock. Uh, he is a sloop, a riverboat, a sloop man. 
uh, he starts the ferry. The ferry will stay in the uh, Kip family right up until the railroad arrives here because Russell's going to buy him out. Henry's son Jan uh, builds this house, sells it in two years to his uncle Jacobus, Jacob, and Jacob leaves it to his son uh, Abraham, and Abraham expands it. I think the original house was there, and the two chimneys, and then the expansion was the left. I don't know that. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing on that. But that house still stands. That house is still here. Very old, old history. Margaret Beekman Livingston. Her husband dies in 1775. Her father dies in 1775. About 10 months apart. She becomes one of the wealthiest women in the state of New York. She's got all of the Livingston inheritance and she's got her father's inheritance uh, on the Beekman side. She's a very un a Dutch woman, very strong. She decides to uh, give her uh, inheritance before she dies. She divides up the property. She has her, and includes the daughters. Very unusual except for the Dutch tradition. The daughters are entitled to an equal amount of inheritance. They draw lots, according to history, and um, a lot of them end up in Rhinecliff. Okay. The four top names are all involved in Pittsburghan. There's Robert that I just uh, talked about being so uh, influential. He inherits Claremont. Janet Livingston marries uh, Richard Montgomery. They start out right here in Rhinebeck on Rhinebe and on Livingston Street. Um, they start to build grass mirror. Uh, the war, Revolutionary War starts. Congress makes him a general under Washington. He marches off to Canada and is killed storming the um, plains of uh, Abraham in way back. Uh, Janet then builds Montgomery Place, but not till she's 52 and never married. Lydia marries General John Armstrong, Rokeby, right? We know all of this, of all of these, only Rokeby is still in the family. And that's right here. John, uh, now let's come to the uh, people that are in, involved in in Kipsbergen. Uh, Henry Beekman Livingston inherits the house from his father. That's the Kip house, the one that was built in 1700 and something. Uh, Gertrude marries a Morgan, a Morgan Lewis. Uh, they live uh, south in, um, in the vicinity of Statsburg, but they have a daughter who marries a Livingston and builds Ellersee. LRC is the closest estate from here, from Chatsville Avenue. As we're going south, you're going to hit LRC, Wildercliff, and Linwood. Catherine Livingston marries a freeborn garrison. He's a minister, Methodist minister, and they build Winder Wildercliff. Wilder, named after, they think, uh, the petroglyph that they found out in a swamp in front of their uh, property. Margaret Livingston marries a doctor, Thomas Tillotson. Tillotson and Garrison are from Maryland. They're acquaintances, they're friends. He comes up, visits, meets the daughter. They both end up marrying Livingstons, and they have Linwood. Okay. The Kip House is, expend is, is expanded by, uh, by Henry Beekman. Uh, I said he married, and uh, a couple of years after Janet died, um, he wanted a presence in this area. It is the only piece of property that the Kips sold outside of their own family, but they eventually get it back. But uh, that was kind of a mystery to historians. How did Henry Beekman talk the Kips into selling their heritage? 
I don't know. Gertrude and Margaret Lewis, Ellersee. Uh, this uh, is a picture that uh, Joanne is going to address because this picture was taken much later when uh, uh, Levi P. Morton owned it. We'll go through the history of that. But uh, a, a huge estate that starts right here at the Hamlet uh, border and runs uh, south for a lot of acreage. Next. This is what Wildercliff looks like today. Uh, they're restoring this house or adding to it. There's a uh, uh, a uh, notice before the uh, planning board to uh, for a variance to put in a swimming pool and a tennis court or whatever. But it's uh, looks alive and well and still there. And this is uh, Linwood. Linwood uh, is now occupied by the uh, Sisters of Ursula. Beautiful piece of property on the south, um, looking right straight down the Hudson River. Um, had a complicated history. I won't get into all of that, but it's still there today. One more. The, the Kipps not to be uh, left out. A relative of all these Kips uh, buys uh, from uh, Beekman and from other Kips uh, the Ankeny Farm, 1832, and they build that uh, mansion. They're there for a hundred and some years, up until 1930-something, and I believe Ryan um, acquired it, and from Ryan comes Creed, but basically that estate is still there. All that land is north of here. The house is gone. The house is gone? Yeah. Yep. I never got back in there to take a look. So here we have Rhinecliff. <laughs> All right. Kipsbergen. All the property south taken up by um, these big estates to the north by this estate. Just to finish off the estates. There's Rokeby, Whitliffs, Montgomery Place is a historical, and Grassmere is uh, under development now. They're going to build a Grassmere Hotel or something off of 9G. So that, uh, that completes. Let's talk a little bit about Kipsbergen and the river. Uh, Long Dock and Slate Dock are the center of the commercial activity. Controlled by the Kips, uh, a Kip daughter, Caroline, marries a Slate. We don't know whether the name Slate Dock is a uh, derivation of the S-L-E-I-G-H-T or it's because they were shipping tons of, of Slate out of it. I don't know. I can't answer that uh, question. But Slate was a very big business in the early 1800s. According to the 1820 Gazette, Rhinebeck employed more people uh, in the slate, blue slate business, than any other activity. Long Dock is for the ferry landing. They're still going. Slate Dock is freight. They've developed uh, 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 pens for animals. There's a uh, twice a week shipment to New York of uh, livestock. Um, Fulton and his steamboat come into play. The Erie Canal and the D&H Canal open up. That's uh, uh, so. Kipsbergen was a vital commercial hub, transportation, the river. And Kelly buys Ellersee. Uh, Kelly is uh, develops a very uh, forward-looking agricultural farm. Uh, it reported that he was shipping 800 tons of hay to New York City for their, for their horses. He's buying a manure from across the river from the canal, uh, horses and mules, and fertilizing his, his property. Uh, he has a, a, a classic uh, model farm, employs a lot of people. Okay. Now we come to the Hudson River Railroad. Charles Russell 
is a director of that railroad. And he buys basically, basically the only property left between the commercial activity going on up here at Slate Dock and all the estates down here. He buys a 240-acre farm from a man named Schatzel. We are on Schatzel Avenue. This is the heart of the farm. But he's a very aggressive entrepreneur. He figures things out. He relocates the ferry landing. He, he buys the ferry monopoly from the Kip family. He relocates the ferry landing right down here to the Schatzel Dock. He builds new ferry boats, steel hulled so they can handle the uh, ice in the river a lot of times. He coordinates the ferry and around the uh, railroad schedules. And most important, he hires a man by the name of George Veach as an architect for uh, this community. It is, it is Veach who names it Rhinecliffe. And you're right, it was Bormansville, it was Hermansville, there was a lot of names uh, to it. But uh, basically in the, uh, in the 1850s it becomes Rhinecliffe. We're now in the modern era. Okay. This is a uh, 1857 map showing you how Veach laid out Rhinecliffe without any regard to where the hills are or where the streams are or anything. Right up here is a house that is sitting where they built the uh, railroad station that you're celebrating today. I live in this house. It goes back to the 18-something uh, when I renovated, I took papers, newspapers that they stuffed into the window, and we've got uh, stories of Sherman marching through Georgia. True story. I ironed them out and pressed them out to keep them. Old house. And you can see there aren't very many, many of the lots are not occupied here. 57, 1857. Uh... About the same time, a few things are going on. Wilderstein, the daughter of Freeborn Garrison, Mary Garrison, uh, never married, a dwarf, sells 52 acres to a Robert Sukley, and that starts Wilderstein. In the meantime, uh, the people at... Um, and the builder was Veach of the first house there. Really? See? He, he, we'll get into it later, but he designed a church up there. He designed uh, that house that I'm going to talk about right here, this uh, Wincliffe. That is um, Elizabeth Shinnermore Jones, one of the grand dams of New York society. Had houses uh, in lots of places, but had Veach designed this... Uh, Hudson River Gothic, Edith Wharton said. Edith was a niece and, and wrote about it. Anyway, there, except for uh, Wincliffe, which is uh, abandoned, um, Wilderstein is still uh, going on. Now comes Vanderbilt. Uh, you know more about this than I do. You're the railroad experts, but he begins to take over the uh, Hudson River Railroad. He starts buying stock. I'm told $100 a share. Um, he starts Grand Central Station. You already talked about that. And there's the Rhinecliffe Station. And there's the new road that Wint talked about. But we got to move Captain Schultz's house. Captain Schultz, I own Captain Schultz's house. That's it. They moved it literally two buildings down and stuck it on a bare lot. The roof of the house I live in, and this one overlaps. There, it wasn't, no zoning in those days, I can tell you that. Okay. The churches. Mary Garrison gave land and money to build the Methodist church, the stone building up there. It's on Orchard Street. It's uh, occupied as a uh, uh, residence today. Um, 
Next comes the Episcopal Church. All that's left is that kind of, um, what, front door facade. Uh, it's on Grinnell Street, looks right out over the river, beautiful location. Uh, Russell gave land to the church to build that. Then comes Veach, who designed the Catholic Church, St. Joseph. I believe it was 58, whatever. It's still going today, still active. Okay. Uh, you can tell Russell developed Rhinecliffe. The street names are all related. Russell Avenue, there's Schatzel for the farm he bought, right out here. Grinnell Street, Grinnell, I'm told, was also on the board of the Duchess uh, of the uh, Hudson uh, River uh, Railroad. He married a Howland, there's your Howland Avenue. He had a brother named William. <coughs> What can I tell you? If you get to develop to your own town, you can name it as you want. Rhinecliff today. Well, it's gone from being called the River Rats to the last uh, announcement I saw in a paper for something for sale to Rhinecliff Cheek. Uh, River Rats, the uh, arm patch insignia of the Volunteer Fire Department shows the river rats. Yeah, they were called that. So we have, uh, it's a small, tight-knit community. It's defined by the zip code 12574. If you live outside the zip code, you're not in, Rhine, in the hamlet of Rhinecliff. You get your mail delivered. We walk to the post office. Uh, it's a mix of commuters, weekenders, retirees like me. Uh, old timers, new professionals. There's still Kips here. There's still Van Ettens here. Property taxes, uh, property values have soared along with the taxes. A quick story I uh, had a contract to buy a house up on Grinnell Street. I won't go into any more detail than that. $100,000. It sold a couple of years later for a million three. They did put some money into it, but this is, this is what I'm talking about. It's a, but anyway, it's a delightful, laid-back community. It's a fun place uh, to retire to. Joanne? Right. Yes, Joanne didn't know I was going to throw this up here, but this is um, a reproduction of one of the original blueprints for the Ward Library, which are excellent. Um, and uh, for me, it shows the elevation from the street in front of it, which at that point is called Kelly's Precinct. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the plating window in the, um, the gable that faces the street. And then on the left is the entry porch with the front door right there. Wonderful little eyebrow window up in the roof above it. And on the right-hand side, set back, which you can tell in elevation, is a wing that um, has an arc. And it actually says, uh, no, actually, if I get closer, I'm already, but it says, Reading Room and Industrial Cottage to be erected at Rycliffe, New York, for Mr. Levi P. Morton. And, uh, yes, Hoppin and Cohen and Huntington. You know, five Hoppin and Cohen did the uh, Episcopal Church, Church of the Messiah, in uh, Ryan Beck, among other things. And um, the other pictures are all yours. <laughs> Thank you. you. You gave half my speech. After, after you talk. <laughs> oh, there he is. You want to show the other pictures just so they're held in people's minds? That, that's a kind of sketch that, a sketch we use, well, and this we use for a bookmark a long time. And then the actual picture, you can show that, too, if people, yeah, was, the, you didn't transfer small. it? Oh, too small, okay, yeah. good. All right, well, I'll start. My name is Joanne Meyer. I'm the executive director of the Morton Memorial Library and Community House, and I was very surprised and flattered when Warren asked me to speak a little bit about the library and the Morton family. Um, I know a lot has been covered already about the Morton connection to the river and the railroad, but I'll just, I'll stick to the Morton Library and the Morton family in my little talk, because I know we're, it's been a long day and we're winding down. Um, 
If you've seen the Morton Memorial Library and Community House right up there, I hope you come to visit inside sometime. I'll be happy to show you around. It's been in continuous operation for more than a century, and we have really breathed life into it, as Warren mentioned a little while ago. We have a cute little public library, but we also have the wonderful Morton Hall, and we have a rec space in the ground floor, and we've had an attic that was used for classes years ago. It's just a really interesting old building that is in continual use and we love having it used all the time so please come and take a look if you haven't seen it it's just up the block and to the right um, it is um, well let me talk about Levi P Morton a bit he is the fellow who had that Ellerslie estate that we've been talking about a mile down the road uh, he actually was born in Shoreham Vermont humble beginnings. The Morton family was a Mayflower family, but he kind of worked himself up. He was a, you know, a dry goods uh, salesman, a teacher, and then he got into the banking world. He just was a hard worker. He never really got a college degree, although he was conferred uh, honorary degrees. Just a humble, hardworking man who became prominent in this area and nationally. I just want to read to you some of the highlights of his career. Um, he was born in 1824, died in 1920, so he lived a very long 96 year life. Um, and he was an American businessman, banker, diplomat, and statesman. He founded the banking. Sorry, what did I do? Is that me? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> he founded the banking firm of L.P. Morton and Company in New York City. After an unsuccessful run for Congress in 1876, he was elected to the U.S. House of Repre Representatives from New York in 1878. He was the minister to France from 1881 to 1885, and he was elected vice president of the U.S. under Benjamin Harrison in 1888 and served as governor of New York in 1895 and 1896. In 1899, he founded the Morton Company and retired the Morton Guarantee Trust Company, retired after the company merged with, sorry, Guarantee Trust. Anyway, iterations of the Morton family name in the banking world. Um, one of the most interesting facts about Levi that I like is the fact that when he was the ambassador to France, he drove the first nail into the Statue of Liberty's foot as she was being put together before she was transported here. He was the minister who accepted the Statue of Liberty for this country. So I just love that idea that he's in Paris hammering that first rivet in. And um, I believe when Benjamin Harrison selected him as his vice presidential uh, nominee, it was announced at the Astor Home in Rhinebeck here. When does that ring a bell to you? Was that, a, did they announce his nomination there? It was the existing building that was mm -hmm. announced on that location. Okay. They had rented because they were in the process of building. It was. Uh huh. Okay. It was the Huntington family house they called Bois Dore that they, they right up rented there. for a season or for uh, two years. Mm hmm. And didn't move into the big Ellerslie, I think, until that was election. I'm a little unclear. About yeah. That. Well, the Ellerslie that we've been talking about, Morgan Lewis, and um, uh, Jack was talking about Morgan Lewis, and then Kelly. So in 1887 is when Levi Morton tore down that beautiful old Ellerslie picture that we saw in Jack's presentation and put up his, what we saw was what Levi put up. They had torn down the other mansion in 1887 and the architect they hired for that was Richard Morris Hunt, a very well-known architect of that era, the Gilded Age. And obviously Levi Morton was friends with those other people of the Gilded Age, the Astors, the Vanderbilts, Vanderbilts. He was obviously associated with the railroad station coming up here, as you alluded to. It was just that era, just his home where he was living. His career kind of wound down at the end of the 1800s. And one of his last acts of public service was making the Morton Memorial Library and Community House. He was married twice, his first wife Lucy died, and then he married Anna Livingston. So he too was kind of in that whole Livingston circle because she was from this area. And um, they, they call it Morton Memorial. It was originally Rhinecliff Memorial. 
It was started in 1905, uh, the building. And it's a memorial because their daughter Lena had died in 1904 in Paris of a ruptured appendix. And that's why it's called Mort Memorial Library and Community House, because Lena died young. She apparently loved the community of Rhinecliff. And the library has been a real community center. They had baths, they had recreation classes, they had community dinners, they had everything. It really was a community center for more than a century. So for me personally, it's just a wonderful experience to be there and feel all that energy and activity around me. And that's why I think it's really interesting that we are located here near the river and you know, Ellerslie is just a mile down the road, so it's, it's really, really interesting to have it all. This is the matrix right here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, let me just refresh. Oh, yes, one of the reasons I am here today is you may have seen mention of something called the Big Read. And it's something I'm promoting in conjunction with Bard College the Tivoli and Red Hook and Germantown and Kingston libraries were all doing one of these huge big read projects. The federal government helps provide money to get books for us and publicity. And I have a flyer, so on the website you could see this, the total schedule of events, and we have events going up at Morton. The book that we're reading is Housekeeping, and one of the big themes is a train and railroad. So that's why I kind of promoted this event as part of our big read, in case you were wondering. We've kind of looped that in too. But it would be great if you read the book and participated over the next several weeks in some of the big read events too, because the railroad and, you know, it's a big theme in the book, so. Um, now, Levi, um, he, as you know, he was a prominent citizen, but he sounded like he was a pretty nice guy also. And to wrap up my little talk here, I want to read the last paragraph of a biography of him, which I think is very, very sweet. During the last years of his life, it became the custom for the school children of the neighboring village of Rhinecliffe to visit El Ellerslie each year. His wife had already died um, at this time on May 16th in honor of his birthday. On May 8th, 1920, he arrived from Washington slightly indisposed but eager to welcome the accustomed visit soon to be made. But when the 16th came, his 96th birthday, his condition was critical. The children, however, were not sent away. They were given their usual reception, only the customary greeting from their aged host was lacking. Their young voices had scarcely ceased to resound through the spacious grounds when the crisis came, and at 8.30 that same evening, Levi, P. Mor Levi Parsons Morton passed peace of, peacefully away so much for reading. Anyway, I think it's a, a very nice way to end my talk. We always celebrate the day of Levi's birth and death, May 16th, every year at the library. We have children having a party and eating ice cream in his honor, so we will do that again this year. And again, I invite you to come and see the building inside and out. Yes, Bella? Oh, the baths. I'm not quite sure. I think... Sorry the book. Okay, Levi. I believe they were in the ground floor of the building. Warren, do you, you've seen the prints. There were no signs of the baths on the drawing. No. I think they were in the ground floor level, and it was like a community bath. I'm not quite sure of the source of the water or where it went out to, but they did everything there. It really was a community. It, you know, a lot of the railroad laborers lived here. A lot of the estate laborers lived here. And they, the Morton family felt obliged to make this a community home with all those services, and they did. So I can't tell you exactly where the baths were, but they were there. And Warren has helped us uh, immeasurably some, with some of the improvements at Morton, so that's why I was hoping he would know where the baths were, but <laughs> we'll have to dig around some more. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes? Uh, where did the portrait of uh, Ulysses S. Grant come from? Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was just recently I was just reading in one of these books that at his home in New York City he had portraits and they mentioned the Grant portrait which is hanging in the hallway but the author of the book did not mention who the artist was many years ago the Rhinecliff Rhinebeck Theater Society cleaned 
the painting, but nobody read the back of it to see who the artist was or when it was done. But I know it was quite a long time ago. And we have talked about having an archivist from West Point come and visit because, you know, they might be able to I identify it. Do you know anything about that, the grant connection or the portrait? Uh, well, they were personal friends. Mm -hmm. uh, President and Mrs. Grant stayed with the Mortons in their big house in Newport. Yeah. In fact, the house was greatly enlarged because they were going to have a presidential ball there. And uh, I suspect they stayed close until Grant died. But, uh, and, you know, they were both loyal Republicans, so what can I say? And uh, I'm not surprised that. Yes. Well, one of these days we will pull that painting apart from the wall and somebody can stick their head up there and see if there's any identifiers at all because it's a lovely, lovely painting. But it's just enormous and the frame itself is something to deal with. So, <laughs> anyway. Um, anyway, I, I think I've wrapped up. Unless you have other questions, I'm very happy to be uh, part of it. Thank you. Well, I, I just say about Morton, he, he was, in retrospect, he was almost unique uh, for being a, a, a national and international leader in finance, investments, as well as in public service, uh, for his reputation of just flint like honesty. And mm -hmm. this was a very unusual thing in the, in the Gilded Age after the Civil War. And time and time again, he steered the groups he was with, the, the policies that he influenced, the legislation in, in, a, in a direction which reflected his New England uh, honesty uh, approach to it. And, and people didn't mind that. They just said, well, that's, that's Morton. He's, he's going to take that, that position. Let's go over and see what, how many cats we can skin over here. Uh, but it's kind of nice that our premier citizen had that reputation and deserved it. Yes, and one of the things that I noticed in everything I read about him, how low key he was. He really didn't yeah. put himself out there, but he was very generous and very civic minded. And I can't remember, it was during the Civil War, he incurred debts with some other business people, oh, yeah. and he felt terrible about it. And many years later, he invited them to a dinner party, and all the money was at their dinner plates, he re repaid them that way, he just couldn't let it go. So uh, apparently that was the kind of fellow he was. And the family was, was that civic minded. So we are all benefiting from that more than 100 years later. Thank you. So there you have it from the uh, epi epicenter of the universe here in uh, Hamlet of Franklin. And uh, I want to thank all of our speakers today who have uh, increase our knowledge about railroad things and the um, history of Hudson River, families here. Um, again, I want to thank our proprietor, uh, James Chapman, who also filled us in on the history of the hotel uh, during lunch. And um, thank all of you for coming today, spending a day with us. And it's even nice. Maybe it's getting warmer. <laughs> <laughs>